Hello and welcome back to Science on Trial and Error. I'm Kasia Kuzmich Kowalska and it's already episode 7. This is exciting. Thank you for joining me today and don't forget to subscribe to our channels to not miss episodes in the future. Check out our Instagram stories to see more of the behind the scenes and join the discussions after the episodes. I would love to hear more from you. You can also reach me through our email, scienceontrialanderror at gmail.com. And now, time to introduce this week's guest, Maria Zhuldibina. Maria is a physicist from Russia, and she has just obtained her PhD from École de Technologie Supérieure in Montreal, in Canada. Her work was focused on quality control of printed electronics with the use of terahertz radiation. Prior to that, she studied physics at Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology in Russia. But besides her impressive academic achievements, Maria is an entrepreneur. She is a CEO and co-founder of a company, Track, based in Montreal. She is currently working on implementing the technology that she developed and patented during her PhD for industry applications. I have met Masha through our joint friend Lena, and this is recording of our first conversation. I am extremely happy that we had a chance to talk, and honestly, I instantaneously felt that we are very similar, and we had an amazing connection. Maria loves challenging herself, and she's not slowing down. Her story clearly shows how small missteps and failures can happen, but with hard work and determination, one can overcome them and become even stronger. Please welcome Maria Zhuldibina. Hi, Maria. Thank you for accepting the invitation to the podcast. I'm so happy uh, you are my guest. Hi, Kasia. Thank you so much for your invitation. It's a great, big pleasure to be invited by someone from so far away from Canada. <laughs> and I'm happy to be here today. Yeah, I'm very happy you, you can join us and you can tell us a bit about your work and your research. Let me start by asking you just like a very let's call it a relaxed question so i like to ask the people that i speak with whether they have any kind of music that they listen to at work uh so when i'm writing articles i don't like listen to anything it's mm -hmm. too complicated for me to focus honestly uh when i just do that analysis so experiment sometimes it depends on my mood mm -hmm. sometimes i'm re i'm listening to russian pop music <laughs> Or something like just general pop. I don't have a really strong uh, taste in music, honestly, in general. Okay, cool. How about we we start by talking a little bit about your work and your research? So you've recently defended your PhD, right? Congratulations. Thank you very much. I was thinking, yeah, maybe we can we can start with this. Yeah, I'm very curious. I tried to, you know, do my pre-interview work and figure out what is it you are working on. Uh, so I know it involves terahertz radiation and I kind of know what it is, but I would be very curious to hear, to hear from you first and then ask my questions. Uh, sure, like I love my work actually. So <laughs> basically I'm working on quality control of printed electronics using terahertz radiation. Let's start from simple printable electronics. So basically it's a new, new way to produce uh, electronic devices uh, by simply printing them. So technically you can take a, a general printer from home or office, put in metallic ink and print any type of electronic components. Wow. So this is a quite brand new technology for the production of electronic devices. And in order to bring this technology to the global like mass production way, the quality control should be well developed, especially of the process of the printing. Uh, because today, even in the industrial scale, there is always someone at the end of the production line who is checking manually, like for example, conductivity, or like how well the ink is spreading during the printing. I see. Using like a optical microscope. So you're basically taking the printed uh, circuit, put it in, like bring it to the lab and do the quality control check. Uh, beginning my PhD, my professor, Francois Blanchard, uh, proposed an idea how to do quality control by using metamaterials. So there's a lot of uh, different subjects of research combined together. Yeah. And the idea is by printing uh, metamaterials, 
as a quality control structure. So basically, it's a similar strategy as for the graphic printing, where next to the main uh, printed uh, product, mm -hmm. it can be food packaging or newspaper. There's always a color barcode next yeah. to it. And you probably have seen it like when you buy juice or milk, etc. So these color barcodes, they show the quality of the color of the printed ink. We have similar strategy, but in our case, we control the quality of the conductive printed ink. So this metamaterial structure, they contain information about the quality of the printed ink. Mm -hmm. And the metamaterial, what is it? It's resonating structure, right? And the resonance of this meta printed metamaterials contain the information about the ink behavior, is either conductivity or uh, ink spreading behavior. Okay. And the beauty of it, the resolution of printed electronics industry today is in the range of hundreds of micrometers. This is the perfect size of resonating structure for terahertz radiation. So terahertz radiation is the radiation, which is located between 0 0.3 up to 3 millimeter waves. Mm -hmm. So it's in frequencies from 100 gigahertz up to 10 terahertz. And by using terahertz radiation, we investigate the properties of the resonance of metamaterials, and we correspond them with the properties of the main printed devices next to this quality control structure. So during the PhD, we have studied the conductivity and geometry if ink is um, shrink or enlarge. The metamaterials, they uh, affect accordingly to the, what is happening in the production line. And we have done a study of this and uh, published a couple of interesting articles, I would say. <laughs> so these metamaterials, uh, did you also develop them in a way that they would give you all of the information that you need or you are more developing the technology that then can penetrate the metamaterial, so the terahertz technology? So basically metamaterials is quite well studied subject. Well, I cannot say quite well studied, but it's, it's a developed subject and there is like already a lot of publication on properties of metamaterials of the resonance and stuff. Yeah. We just check and look what we can do based on it. And we choose a particular shape of metamaterials to uh, be printable because it's very important as well. We are not limited only by the frequency. We also limited by the printer resolution. Right? So, so on the technology available in the lab. <laughs> yeah, of course. So, I just printed them with different techniques and uh, done like a big study depending on different printed parameters, how they're going to behave. I think I know quite well the printing techniques. The entire fabrication process is important to know. I didn't do it by myself because you can do entire PhD on the developing like particular printing technique. I have quite limited time. <laughs> so in my case, like I design the, the simulation and then uh, study like the properties using terahertz radiation and the idea was just basically since it's a new idea we have to do study using conventional methods and compare with new developed like novel technology so the conventional method you said it's someone checking it by eye through the microscope, so it was you? Yeah. Okay. Yes, I was doing like a <laughs> comparison by myself between uh -huh. methods such as atomic force microscopy, everybody knows, yeah. like four point prop, multimeter, and then optical microscopy. So I uh, use these techniques, which is very well developed, especially for this field, and then compare the performance with our method. But how actually did you come up to studying this. You were doing something different in Russia, right? Yes. Was it just by chance that you just found this project or were you looking for something like this? So basically, when I came to Ecole Technologie Supérieure, uh, I had a chance to work on quality control of printed electronics. Back then, we didn't define its terahertz or other okay. techniques. The general was broad name. Uh, and the other choice was something to study some piezoelectric materials. And then for me, it was like, 
oh, like creative directory sounds interesting. And I had a chance to go like to the company around to see how it's working. And for me, it looks pretty cool. Then I, I was in the group of that professor. My professor was my co-director. And then after a comprehensive exam, I realized that most of my research will be in terahertz radiation. And this is how I switched the role of the professors. And I started doing my research under supervision of François Blanchard. From what I know, you actually patented your method, right? Yes, we patent our idea. And now you are starting your own, I mean, you've started your own company. Yes. <laughs> it's called, am I reading it correctly, track you see? Uh, just track. We just, everybody say track you see, but no, it's just simply track. Okay. Uh, which means uh, TRA assessment of quality control. Uh, phonetically, it sounds like track, track in something. So when I patent, the first patent with my professor, at that time I was like, oh, like it seems like the market of printable electronics is growing pretty fast. And I was like, why not to try? And luckily that time I was taking a class uh, in that university in Montreal. Montreal is a bilingual city. So I'm from École de Technologie Supérieure, which mm -hmm. is French university. And back then I didn't speak French. So I had to take <laughs> class in the English speaking university. It's McGill University, it's quite a famous one. Uh, I took a class there and I met my partner, a business partner. And uh, once we had a beer with his scientific group and my group together, and I told him, oh, you know, like I want to do startup. That, back then I was alone <laughs> and I kind of did elevator pitch, which is like one minute you need to yeah. talk about your idea. So I told him, I was like, oh, it sounds interesting. I was like, oh, do you want to join? And like, like this, we decided to go together. This <laughs> and, is amazing. Uh, Yes, and year ago, uh, we participated in acceleration program in Montreal, one of the very big incubators called Suntech. Wow. And we been quite good, I think, <laughs> back then. And uh, we started the journey of a startup. And there's a lot of things which you can't ex expect appearing, uh, especially like we are scientists, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm already doing business. There is uh, accounting, financial <laughs> stuff. You need to talk to people who are totally from different backgrounds, different fields, and it's it's much more different than scientific conferences we used to participate. Of course. It takes a lot of time, but it's an interesting journey. Exactly. There's a lot of challenges, I guess, a lot of like learning curve to get used to all of the aspects of it. From what I saw on your website, you you are using the technology... To, to offer the quality control. So just to know a bit more about how it works, like do people need special printers to use your technology? No, this is the, this is the benefit of our technology is that it can be implemented on the existing printing machines. So I'm talking about industrial production way. So it's, it's huge press to be for the uh, newspapers manufacturing. And uh, this technology is quite new. In general, terahertz radiation, if you look back 30 years ago, it didn't exist on the spectrum, right? Yeah. Printable electronics is a very new industrial way or like fa fabrication way for the production. At the same time, terahertz radiation in general, it's, it's very well developed in the lab scale, but it's very rarely going outside of the lab. And that's why we have now kind of some difficulties to make it work in the industry. So we have proved the concept in the lab and we need to make it smaller now to bring it to the industrial line. This is what we are working on right now. So usually it's vice versa. You have something small, you want to make it. Big. In our case, <laughs> imagine it's a huge optical table with lasers and a bunch of optics and you need to miniaturize it and bring it to the industry. That's yeah, that sounds challenging because you need the lasers to to emit the terahertz radiation, right? No, like the laser wouldn't, like you need to have, for example, antennas. Like okay. there is few ways to produce a, a detector has radiation. So basically for recording it, you need to use electronic. For generation, yes. you need to use optical pulse, right? So in my case, we have been using photoconduct antennas for generation and detection. Uh, there is some technologies which are existing on the market, but there are very few companies in the world which are producing this kind of small version of the huge uh, entire system. And this is what we want like to try to implement for the beginning. Then we will see how it's going to go. The development of the technology in general, like 
in the lab, it's uh, it's a boom right now. Like people trying uh, very different techniques. But I was wondering, this technology that you're developing, it uses the terahertz uh, radiation. Could you also think of using different kind of radiation in your technology for like m smaller things? Is that like something that is doable? It's not only the part of the radiation, right? It's also about the, the materials. Way in it no 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 it's well materials of course mm -hmm. and uh, also the way i'm doing there has time domain spectroscopy so the beauty of that you can extract simultaneously the information which you need right yes i can i mean amplitude and phase at the same time and this allows to extract uh, any properties of the materials this is one thing. Also, the terahertz radiation properties in, in general, like it's a uh, low energy radiation. Yes. Uh, for example. Yes. So it's good, for example, for being accepted in the production line, right? You cannot put X-ray open exactly. area. Exactly. Right? There is less danger to people. And it actually, from what I've read, it starts to have much more wider like ideas for application, but it is still... There's uh, tons of applications, but they're all done in the lab. Yeah, exactly. Like this is still very early stages and there is not much in industry happening. So yeah, you found your niche and this is also very, very impressive. You have the company, you are, yeah, you are selling the technology and you basically said you have like a research and development part as well to it. So you as a CEO, are you actually able to do any kind of research anymore or you just have to manage people? I don't have that much people to manage. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, we are two, and also I have some help uh, from a couple of other people. Mm -hmm. I like research so much, and I really would like to focus more on it. <laughs> and I try my best to keep going and doing it. <laughs> This is really exciting. So basically you started the startup while you were still finishing your, your PhD. And you said you, you participated in this incubator, which probably provided you a bit more with like a background of how to really start a company. And now, as you said, there's many, many challenges that are kind of coming your way. How do you now adapt to this new role? Are you taking some classes additionally? What's your plan for, for your own personal development in this new role? Because it is different than just being, you know, a scientist um, <laughs> in the lab. You're absolutely right. <laughs> well, this is like, uh, I think, the help of the incubator, obviously, to show. But honestly, I think it's something internal of the personality, I would mm -hmm. say, which should be inside, I don't know, from... When you're born, I think it's already something what you have and your character and such. So that's why I think it's not too complicated for me. For me, it's complicated to let people do something. So <laughs> I know that I, I try to control too much. And uh, it's like a story. Like I remember when we just, just started Incubator. So basically when we start really move forward, like to look for the potential clients and et cetera, et cetera. So one day Ben told me, I made a website and I was like, how come? Like you didn't even ask me. <laughs> I, I was I was shocked, and I was like, for me, it was the first moment that someone kind of took one part of my responsibility. Right now, I, I'm laughing at myself back then, but that time, I was like, someone is still my baby. I get it. I get it. <laughs> it's super hard for me to let someone uh, do something, but I'm working on it. Give more responsibilities, like not doing everything by myself, and it's very important. I think many people tend to take control of the situation and work and everything. It, what should be learned, like for being a good manager, like that you can give responsibility to someone else. In this case, your life will be better and you will have more time to work on what is really important today. Yeah, the delegating. But of course, as you said, you treat it as your baby. So then it is sometimes hard to let go and, and kind of trust that other people would do it as you want to do it. This sounds all super cool. So the company is based in, in Canada and in Montreal, as you said. Yes, yes. But are you planning to be international in, in your sales or like is it still Canada based? Let me make the first product and then <laughs> we can continue to the conversation. All right. It sounds really cool, mm -hmm. but uh, we will see where it's going to be. I believe it's going to work, but uh, I want to make 
one step. Of course. I get it. As you said, certain things have to be inside you to to take over such a such a path for yourself. And I was wondering, were you always interested in physics? Were you always kind of this person that takes a bit of a leadership? How how was it for you in in school and like when you were when you were a kid? Uh, I was born in a very small city in Russia. Like I grew up as uh, our closest airport is uh, 200 kilometers away, away. So for me, for example, from Montreal to Berezniki, where I'm coming <laughs> from, is like more than a day because I need to fly from Canada. There is no direct flight to yeah. and uh, to Russia, so I fly usually f- through Europe then to Moscow, and then from Moscow the other flight, and then three hours drive is the oh most annoying God. one. <laughs> when I was a kid, like, I was so pretty good in math. I like it. I cannot say that I did too much effort on mathematics. Well, I was studying in a special school for mathematics and physics, and uh, this is when my interest started, especially for physics. We had an amazing teacher, but he's still working. We had like classes for physics, not only solving problems or something, we had experimental part of the class as well. And this is when I was really impressed by what is gonna happen, like what can happen in the nature and how you can explain it. The, I would say I was kind of like, from my point of view, just a good student, nothing extra. Even my physics teacher, like, <laughs> now he say like, no, you're very good, like, you're smart. Like, no one told me that when I was at school. <laughs> I understand. And when I uh, entered to the, like, to the Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology, as Lena mentioned in her yep. uh, story, my physics teacher say, you're going there to get married. You will never finish it. I was like, sure. <laughs> Welcome to Russia. Oh and then God. one of my classmates, when I was already like maybe uh, year fourth of my undergrad or third, I don't remember exactly, during my on my birthday, he told me like, you're doing great. I didn't believe that you will be able to study here. Wow. So I'm really proud of myself today saying like I'm a doctor now. <laughs> exactly. Look how far you got. So yes, basically at school, it was the interest started and then it was kind of already, like, honestly, I was not very much motivated for doing science back then. I was just a good student. I wanted to go to, I really wanted to leave Berezniki. I didn't want to stay here. And uh, I was happy to be accepted in this university as well. It's kind of high ranked university in Russia. I was studying hard, but I was not interested, honestly. So were you also studying spectroscopy? As Lena, uh, no, I was doing opti- uh, optical fibers. I see. Uh, well, I was doing spectroscopy for optical fibers, like not okay. too much difference. <laughs> so yes, and and the Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology there, uh, from the third year, I started going to the laboratory mm-hmm. where, uh, like at the beginning, everybody was making fun of me. I was cutting fibers because there is a particular way you need to cut it to have like total internal reflection, etc. Uh, I was impressed and I really liked working with that. I really like conferences. So if I talk a little bit about my family, all of my family, they uh, used to present on the scene and they're more like artistic. For example, okay. my father was a uh, Russian stand-up. My mom, she's a t- math teacher at school. So she was also like, uh, has a lot of potentials to present somewhere. My brother was also doing stand-up for a very long time. <laughs> and only me was not accepted in this world. <laughs> I see. But you found your way presenting yes. your work. Yes, I found my niche. And I'm really, really happy. So, yes, on the year four, I was presenting the first time at the conference. Uh-huh. And I was really proud of my work. I was studying the spectroscopic properties using FTIR and UV visible spectrometer. This was my uh, undergrad work. And then for for master degree, honestly, like, it was pretty normal in our university. Everybody went, so I was. I didn't even think that I can go abroad or something. It was like just, you know, continue uh, there. Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. So I was just continue doing it, but uh, I lost again my interest. And then I was in the group of friends, and uh, some of them went abroad for master already. And I was like, oh, that's interesting, but. Honestly, I didn't speak English at all that back then, at all. <laughs> they went and I was like, oh, I want to go too. Like, I'm curious. I want to 
Like, yeah. If they were able to do it, why I cannot do it? <laughs> <laughs> this is how like I started looking for the universities abroad. And I wanted to go to North America. And luckily, I found the university in Montreal. I came to the Russian professor in uh, Montreal. I took uh, some time to learn language. It was too complicated at the beginning. I failed comprehensive exam. <laughs> and honestly, today I'm proud of saying it because I want to say to many people that if you really want to, one fail, it doesn't mean anything. Yeah. I fail and he kicked me out. He told me, you don't deserve major in physics. I was like, okay. <gasps> That's harsh. That's really harsh. <laughs> yes. It took me like two months, maybe. I was sending emails around. I wanted to stay in Montreal. I found the other position in the Ecole Technologie Supérieure. And there I started the game with one professor. Then, then I changed with that. So I was really looking for my advisor. And honestly, I can say I found him. And it's we really work uh, well as a team together. Like... Uh, I'm really happy to be part of his team. And I think I was his first student, so he can't complain, I guess. But I'm admiring your perseverance, you know, like you moved to the other ed edge of the world. And yeah, there is a bit of a misstep and you failed the exam. Was it mostly because of the language barrier? I didn't take it serious, honestly. Okay. And then you still push and look and yeah, for me... When I applied to IST, I actually, before applying for PhD, I applied twice for the internship and I was declined twice. It was a bit of a blow, you know, I was like, oh, I wanted to go and I wanted to try to go abroad to do something else. And I was just getting rejections for two years and I really felt, I, I don't know, like it may not happen. But then I applied for the PhD and suddenly, you know, I got accepted here where I really always wanted to come. Yeah, it's just a matter of if you really want to do it, you should really push. I think for me, of course, I can see that I improved over these two years a lot and I did a lot of things that could have like changed my application. But I'm just glad I didn't give up. It's, it's, it's cool to hear such stories. I think people need to have a bit of inspiration there. You mentioned several things that I want to go back to. One of them is you mentioned that your family is involved in a lot of yeah, presenting and they are very probably like outgoing um, people. And you said you also like presenting and actually looking at your resume, I saw that you, you won a award for presenting your PhD in like three minutes or something. Yes. So <laughs> was, this, um, was this in English? Yes, I did it in English. And this was one of like this elevator pitch kind of talks. Yes, I can say so. Like, so it's kind of a famous competition that are all around the world. My thesis in three minutes. And actually, I won it from the second time. Like the <laughs> first year, I got, I passed to the final, but I didn't get to the place. And the second year, I completely changed everything. Well, it's a matter of experience, matter of the competitors as well, right? It's yeah. it's really. It's a competition. You never know how it's going to end up, right? It's like I have this, uh, I think in my personality, I'm very competitive, I would say. And uh, I like to achieve what I really want to. Like, I want to achieve my goals. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. And kind of like push yourself further and further. So did you, did you ask your family for advice when you were preparing for this? I'm not sure if they were that I want it. Okay, I see. So it's not really something that they would consider comparable to their achievements. <laughs> okay. I don't think so. It's like it's really complicated. Uh, even today, for my father, it's kind of, I cannot say weird, but some part of him doesn't accept fully that I'm a strong woman who is doing something big, that I'm not just a wife of someone. And he literally told me this even today, like <laughs> we will talk about hobbies later, but I will just mention now, like I started doing sewing and I'm so passionate about it. Like okay. I can do it nonstop. And he told me, but maybe you should change your career. Like you did your PhD to prove uh, like someone that you are able to do it. I'm like, seriously, after oh, all no. these years, oh, no. you tell me that? <laughs> <laughs> the patriarchy is still strong in Russia. Yeah. I think this is quite, yeah, we laugh about it, but it can be quite harsh because you want them to feel like 
proud of your achievements and for them somehow the better achievement would be to have three kids and <laughs> it's like my pain right now i'm in Berezniki, my hometown i came for a long vacation after my phd i really feel like everybody evaluating me by the status no yes. one is asking me about my work everybody asking me about if i'm married if i have kids question like this and they ask about for example my classmates who knows my <laughs> classmates if this one is married if this one is like come on like we are it doesn't matter i get it yeah it's quite upsetting and i think it happens more often to to female than to to men you won't get this question or at least not so outspoken when you're when you're a guy it is yeah it is upsetting but I'm glad that you are not getting it bring you down because you've achieved so much and like if you think about where you started this even feels like as a better bigger achievement right because you did it all by yourself like you really pushed through a lot of stuff I'm proud of myself that I did it by myself but I cannot say like I think I can do more <laughs> You're not stopping there. This is clear to me. But this is even more admirable. Putting the bar higher and higher, I think probably in a year or two we could talk again and you're going to have so many more stuff to to talk about. Okay, we talked a bit about your your childhood and your background and you mentioned your studies as well. And then, as you said, you, you moved to, to Canada, to Montreal, and it was a bit rough at the beginning with like looking for the place and you didn't know French uh, English well, was let's say also not like completely fluent what other problems did you encounter on your way was it difficult for you to participate in classes too or how did you you manage to go through the studies in the French university. Were you judged a bit based on your lack of French? Did you have a feeling that you should have known it or was it all right? For studying, it was not a problem in general. It's kind of normal that grad students, they don't speak French in Montreal. I would say it's okay, but still, if you speak the language, you have more opportunities. For a PhD, it was not that complicated because one of the classes I took you could ask question in English if you don't understand or something. The literature was usually English books okay. or something yeah. like that. It was, it was all right. But I didn't participate actively because I like I was sure that I'm stupid. Come on, like I was hearing it the entire my life. <laughs> 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 and this is the class which I mentioned before in uh, McGill University. This is the class when I really believed in myself because it's top university. And when I got my grade there, I was like, oh, but I actually can do something. People were asking me questions from the homework. Judging about the language, it uh, was not any problem. But I really like teaching. It's My mom is a teacher. My grandparents used to be teachers. My even previous generations, like we have a like, big teacher's uh, <laughs> history in the family. Uh, when I came to Montreal, I was working in the school for Russian-speaking kids mm -hmm. uh, at Saturday school, and I was giving math classes there. Nice. And eventually I was like, okay, it's already enough. Like, I really got experience which I wanted because before I was doing private tutoring only, so I really wanted to teach for the group. And I was like, I really need to move forward. And I want to do it at the university level. I knew that I cannot teach the class, but I can be a teacher assistant. I say like myself that I should learn French in order to give classes because in my university for undergrad is only in French. Yeah. The English is like is countable there. I learn French. I work very hard on it. I took French classes almost every day in different places and also imagine it's student life. Wow. I was I knew I can tell you all three classes in Montreal for French. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, after I stopped working in Russian school, I gave first uh, teaching assistant uh, course. It was very interesting experience. Poor uh, students, I apologize a lot, but uh, I was giving them more. I think if I would be like general TA, because I understand my lack of l uh, knowledge of the language, so I try my best to explain. And you know, when you need to explain something in your in foreign language, you need to understand it very deep. <laughs> yeah, because otherwise you will not be able to convey convey it the right way. 
Exactly. So this is like this is what's advantage of knowing French that you have much more opportunities. But I, probably you feel the same. I don't know about Austria. Uh I actually learned a bit of German. I also use the pandemics to to learn a bit more. So I can communicate. I think much better than when I came here. But on a daily basis, for our work, of course, I don't need it because we have the English-based institute. So it's more like I can go to a doctor and speak a bit or, or speak with some people that I would meet. I wouldn't say that I could already <laughs> teach in it. I think Vienna is also very international, so you also don't have to know German to get by. We talked a lot about your like you setting up challenges for yourself and going higher and higher and pushing a lot but I'm wondering what do you do to have a bit of a break so you mentioned yeah hobbies and basically how how do you take a break and how do you keep yourself from overworking honestly I really like my research that's why I think uh, happens sometimes that I'm overwhelmed but in general, I enjoy it. Mm -hmm. First of all, I do sport. I can't imagine not doing sport at all. Like I <laughs> thankfully, I'm really glad that my parents pushed me a lot to do. Like I was doing ballet school, musical school. Oof. I was constantly busy when I was studying at school with some extra activities. So it made me to be always in shape and running around, make myself busy. I have this habit, every morning I cannot start my day without workout. It can be 10 minutes, but it should be something. So this is one thing, I, and I really like it a lot. Secondly, I like reading a lot, and now it's less time for that, but... And friends, like I, I'm really open to talk a lot, and I really like talking, as you can <laughs> see. <laughs> I really enjoy talking to my friends and uh, go out partying and stuff. Partying less now, I would say. I like sleeping more than partying, but... <laughs> <laughs> I think it's that age already. Yes, yeah. exactly. And right now, I like sewing a lot. And it's uh, thanks to my boyfriend who, who gave me like a sewing machine. So I can just uh, do it nonstop for a weekend. Like, I if you also don't, like if sewing. I don't need to do anything, I can just sew. <laughs> <laughs> so what are you making? Are you making like clothes for yourself or designing stuff? What are you doing? This hobby is only, uh, I would say, how many maybe five months okay so before i was doing cross teaching and it was very slow and not regular say sewing started in february and i'm doing bags a lot different type and uh, for example uh my friend he has a shop uh, where he's con collecting money for the nation and I make bags for his shop for selling, basically. Nice. <laughs> like, well, for me, I really do it because I like it and I would like to help him. And if I, it can help to someone, save someone's life, like, I, I don't mind. Right now, it's been a time for bags. I believe that I will switch soon because I cannot do something at the same time. I need to <laughs> Yeah, change. challenges. Yes. I know. I get it. I, I actually also have a sewing machine. But I must say, you know, with, with work... I'm sometimes too preoccupied, but I I really like it. I feel like it has a lot of elements to it. There's like a bit of like the design part and you have to think about how everything will connect and really fit together. And yeah, it's fun. I really, I really do like it. Uh, this sounds really cool. Uh, but I must say, it sounds like your day somehow has more than 24 hours i wish i really wish <laughs> it's not enough i am very very impressed and honestly feeling a bit lazy you're definitely driven this is something that we can i think both agree on and and you are as you said you are ambitious and you are a bit competitive so i guess this also comes into play so do you find yourself also being being that driven and competitive outside of like your career so do you like for example when you say you do sports have you ever done any like team sports or some like competitions before 
No, I, I never. Well, when I was at school, I was doing a little bit. I regret that my parents never, like when I was a kid, you know, still parents make a choice, decision for you, right? Yes. Where you're going to go. So I think I would be very good sportsman. Yeah, I actually, that's, that's why I'm <laughs> asking, because it seems like these are all the traits that you really need and like this hardworking and, and all of these challenges. And I would say probably you would have been really, probably achieved a lot as well in this direction. Okay, let's now move maybe a bit more into this like st standard parts of the podcast. So what I like to ask my guests is, first of all, uh, I call it a room for improvement piece. What in science, research or academia is something that you feel like it's not working very well and you feel like could be improved? I mean, we, get, we can get even broader than science and academia, but just like... What do you find particularly troubling to you? Well, there is always something to improve, right? That's why we're doing science. <laughs> in general, like in the system, for example, matching between professor and student. I know that in university you have this uh, rotation program yes. when you're looking for your perfect match, let's say. In my case, it was not the situation. And uh, by myself, I was doing, looking for this perfect match. So this is what I think should be done at the beginning, like to look for what type of guidance do you want? Because especially when you look for the PhD the first time, like <laughs> the first time, <laughs> I have done it a couple of times. So you don't think about many aspects and we are still human being, right? Even we are scientists. I and agree. it's important in order to find the good way to work together. So this is what should be considered, I think, a lot. Also, like, We all know that to do publication in uh, some high-ranked journal, you need to have your professor needs to have you money. Need to and pay, for example, yeah. that professor, like they're struggling, right? There is like pub publication in Nature is like 6k, I think. This so, is crazy. Yes, and this is a it. It is a business. I totally understand it. But from my perspective, science is not about shouldn't be about money it's more about uh, interest and making something new cool like progress in general so this is i think something which should be somehow solved if it's possible i understand also the other part of like the journals and yeah yeah it's not really helping with sharing the yeah the data and sharing the information and just making in general, the humanity progress faster. I understand this. I wanted to ask whether you think, from your experience, this kind of transition like you did, coming from academia to a bit more like, let's call it industry, like switching to, to have a company, do you get enough help in this kind of situations? And do you think this is like considered a good path for career? Or do you still think it's a bit frowned upon to, to do this kind of thing? So... What was your experience? Because I feel like, I mean, it of course depends also on the country, but in some countries it is not very easy to transition from one to the other. And yeah, there are certain skills that you need to have to, to do that. And of course you can learn them by yourself. I don't know what was your experience in Canada in this direction. I have experience also working in the industry a little bit. Uh, also, uh, I had a time... like. I'm still doing a little bit mm -hmm. of that as well. And I would say business, academia, and industry is different things. Well, there is everywhere some part of each aspect, but it's quite different. And it honestly depends a lot on the personality, what you want to do. For example, industry, like there is space, a room for the research and development, sure, but... I feel like it's less freedom than in the research. That's why I like research a lot because you have all the field for yourself. Like you can, you have no deadlines usually, no expectation, I would say, probably. Well, I mean, there's a bit of a different kind of pressure. Yeah, I get yes, that. Yeah, yes, exactly. So, and uh, for me, uh, business is also somehow research, somehow like industry, like it's a combination of both, I would say. But it's also different. In my case, I'm doing, trying to do business based on my research. That's why I cannot say much about that. So mm -hmm. like my work in the industry, my research and my, my business, they all connected between each other. 
So I'm kind of learning the pro- problem from all around. Again, it depends on the personality a lot, I would say. Yeah, you mentioned this depends on the personality and I completely agree. But from your point of view, if you could give advice to someone who is still, let's say, during their PhD, but has some ideas and is kind of considering, oh, maybe I should actually do a startup or, you know, maybe I should go into a bit more business direction. What would you say is something that is worth learning or worth putting time into to to get prepared better? What would you say would be useful? Don't be afraid asking help. People tend to, to help in general. In this incubator or like in general, people understand that you're coming from different background and people are happy to share their experience in general, I would say. At least from my experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I think this is a good advice. Another question that kind of comes back is if you could meet one person that inspires you, who would it be? Is there anybody who you consider to be an inspiration for you or like a role model or someone who already is even not alive that you would like to talk to? Honestly, my professor is inspiring me a lot. He's so much passionate about his work. He's professor, but he's in the lab almost every day. He's always there to help and he knows so much. For him to catch the idea about this or that research is like super quick. For example, like obviously I don't have this uh, knowledge and abilities as he does. And this is what is inspiring me a lot. And I, this is what I think is important again, that you have this someone who can show by his or her way of working uh studying, learning, whatever, it's important to have someone who is like kind of a spark for you, you know? Yeah. So I think this is like, I would say it's my prof. Yeah, this is nice. You said you liked the teaching a lot and you said you enjoy it, but now you are kind of stepping away from, from the university, from the academia. Who are told you, you that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, I don't know. That's my question. Are you actually planning to continue a bit still in this direction to have postdoc or like a contact with, with academia? Yes, I started my postdoc almost. <laughs> I'm doing it in parallel with the startup. So basically I'm doing R&D for the startup and it's my postdoc at the same time. I'm staying in the same group, basically. It's interesting to do startup and I really hope we will move further and we will really make it work as we want. But at the same time, for business people, it won't sound very good. But in general, in my life, I don't know if it's ever going to happen or when it's going to happen. I want to become a professor because I like research. Yeah. I like teaching a lot and I think it's really, it can be a good combination, you know. Yeah, that's that's what I was thinking. Yeah, when you were speaking that I think you will have a way of, for yourself. And I think all of your experiences, the, the ones in Moscow when you were kind of put down a bit by, you know, by your colleagues, but also by the professors. I mean, Lena said a bit about that and it felt kind of awful. And then you also had some missteps. And I think this makes for even better professors because you know that it doesn't have to always be perfect. Someone doesn't have to have a perfect resume to be a good scientist and to be a good researcher. And I think it's good to have this kind of people and higher places to then change the scientific world a bit in this direction. So I will keep my fingers crossed. I mean, so many things for you are on the way. It's inspiring. I am super, super happy that we had the chance to talk i think your story is is very inspiring and also yeah i think it's a kick of motivation for everybody you can achieve a lot you just have to put your heart to it i i I know it's a lot of hard work as well i'm not trying to downplay it but it's just so cool that that you are in this spot i mean this is this is really impressive thank you so much for sharing and for speaking about your yeah your love for science is very clear and your passion for growth is also very clear and i'm glad that we can share it with the world thanks thank you, thank you so much for the invitation again it's a, it's a big pleasure for me really and it's a nice idea from you because many people they don't understand what is science what is phd like 
I'm sure that many of my relatives still don't know what it means. <laughs> I know. Thank you so yeah. much. I really, really appreciate it.